Hey guys, so do you think you have a small, cramped apartment? Not a lot of square footage? Well, you would feel at home in Hong Kong. This city is considered one of the most expensive in the world, and about 50% of its population doesn't really live in the best conditions. The average square footage for an apartment with five people is 270 to 300 square feet, and there are over 100,000 people in Hong Kong in social housing. However, for almost two decades now, Hong Kong has personified the truth of Eastern accuracy and elegance with its tight and ornate high-rises. Hong Kong is building the tallest buildings in the world, outshining its competitors like Tokyo, New York, Singapore, London, and San Francisco. And if that's not enough, it is the unrivaled record holder for the most skyscrapers. The skyscrapers are both on the mainland and on artificial islands to expand the city's territory. There are 294 skyscrapers here, over 490 feet tall. And if you lived in Hong Kong in the 1990s and were brave enough, you could visit the most densely populated place in the world called Kowloon Walled City, which we'll talk about a little later. Of course, Hong Kongites aren't building their city taller because they have a good life. It's simply because the island doesn't have enough space for the rapidly growing population, a problem for any metropolis. So builders and architects have their job, build tall buildings to be used for offices and commercial organizations, as well as for personal homes. Specialists must consider the increased seismic activity in the region, as well as the destructive nature of powerful typhoons. Hong Kong is home to over 7 million people and is the most densely populated city in the world. The lack of land makes them build on their coasts. It isn't hard to buy high-quality stone here. Hong Kong's extreme conditions help to become the world leader in building reliable, tall, concrete structures. Hong Kong is a huge, overpopulated concrete city between parks you need to take the subway to. From the roof of an apartment building in Mong Kok, where the density is 340,000 people per square mile, you need to really try to find just one tree in all that concrete. However, Hong Kong is an extremely convenient city and has a well-developed public transportation system that even has its own designated lane. On the other hand, there are no wide boulevards to walk along, the sidewalks are overflowing with people, and the roads between the skyscrapers must be crossed at crosswalks, which are placed every second or third level above the road. In civil engineering, cars play a key role so the landscape is broken by multi-level overpasses and road forks, not parks. There's no fresh air to speak of. Daily life flows through Hong Kong's concrete walls, and the people have to split tiny apartments with high costs among several people just to afford it. Sometimes the government provides housing at a discounted rate, but then you'll be in some, shall we say, uh, questionably safe housing. Doors to the roofs of these government buildings are often open, not because you can take amazing pictures from there, but because people, well, they also live on the roofs. So residents in penthouses on the top floor with elevator access pour into the, stel stair pour into the stairwell and go to the roof through the technical floor. According to the original design, there weren't many covered places on the roof, so space under the open sky is also used as housing. Your imagination splits the roof into living rooms, laundromats, and game rooms. Immigrants usually live in these kind of apartments. The center of Hong Kong is extremely wild, and there are frequently entire blocks without a single tree. The buildings are so close to each other, there's barely any light in the narrow alleys between them. Almost half of Hong Kong's population lives in so-called social buildings and uses various types of housing subsidies. Rent in these homes is cheaper than in the private sector. Additionally, it is subsidized from the income received from renting out land and space under parking garages or shops in the social buildings themselves or ones nearby. If a young family is buying a home in Hong Kong, they only ask about the price, not the square footage. 
It's so expensive to live there that many people live in literal 21 square foot homes. A home for a mosquito is what they are often called. And their area is similar to that of a standard garage. They usually have about 183 square feet, but they cost over $500,000. When walking around Hong Kong's Kowloon City District today, it would be hard to imagine that just a few decades ago, it was one of the scariest and atmospheric places in the world. It had many names like Fortress City, Ant Hill, City of Shadow, and each of them reflected its history. In 1890, Kowloon had 50,000 residents, 400 buildings, a dozen factories, totaling 413 by 700 feet, and everything was in order. The boom began after the end of World War II. Kowloon turned into a real black hole whose land was promised to refugees fleeing from the civil war in China, searching for more land. Hong Kong's laws and administration didn't actually operate there, and its residents didn't pay any taxes. The city's territory was divided amongst many triads, the most famous being Sun Yi On, which means rebirth, and 14K. By 1960, all of Hong Kong's criminal activity was run by thugs from the Ant Hill City. At first, the city's territory was full of homes three to five stories tall. But by the mid-20th century, bigger buildings started appearing. They were built without any standards, and the builders didn't stick to safety standards either. The city gradually grew taller like an anthill, adding on new additions. A limit was added later. The maximum height for buildings was 14 stories. Because of how dense the buildings were, almost no air got inside them. So people were oxygen starved. That's why they would use screens instead of doors. The average apartment size was 193 to 215 square feet. So even though criminals flourished in the colony, most of the people were normal law-abiding citizens who, unfortunately, had to simply survive. Initiative groups were gradually created that tried to improve the people's lives. Now, the city's main problem was a lack of space. By 1987, there were 33,000 people. Just five years later, in 1992, the population had almost doubled. The population density reached 2 million people per square kilometer, while it was only a bit over 6,000 in Hong Kong, making it the most densely populated place in the world. Another of Kowloon's problems was a lack of fresh water, since there was never a complete water system. Until 1963, citizens got their fresh drinking water from just a few wells. It was only in the 1960s that the situation started to slightly change because of the influence of the initiative groups and public organizations. In 1987, there were eight operational wells in the city that provided the people fresh water. The situation became more complicated because tons of tiny factories polluted the air. Now, in the mid-1970s, Hong Kong's government finally decided it was time to act and received permission from the Chinese government to hold a large series of police raids. From 1973 to 1974, there were over 2,500 arrests, and despite its wild appearance, the district became fairly peaceful from a criminal perspective. But Kowloon still lacked government control, so the city had many factories and mini factories. Most of them were run by one person, meaning the owner was the worker, bookkeeper, and salesperson. People worked 13 to 15 hours in unsanitary conditions, in factories that made everything you could think of, from decorative figures to shoes and furniture. It was a city in a city that was capable of existing autonomously in many ways. There were also a lot of doctors with about 100 private dentist offices, according to statistics. They all operated without a license, but the doctors had received medical education and diplomas. Other than dentists, there were also unspecialized doctors who provided their services for prices affordable to most of the population. Medical care was much more expensive in Hong Kong itself, so there wasn't a lack of patients. There weren't really any roads in the Ant Hill. There were passages forming a very maze-like network that you could easily get lost in if you weren't familiar with it. Roofs became areas to relax because you could find at least some kind of 
vacant space. People played and raised children there. They met and talked with their parents. Planes flew 500 feet over the roofs when they came to land at uh, Kai Tak Airport. The airport was the reason the buildings in the area were limited to 14 stories. It was just about the only requirement from Hong Kong's administration that the people followed. In 1987, Hong Kong's government announced a plan to demolish the walled city. After a difficult process of resettling the people, the city was demolished from March 1993 to April 1994. It was replaced with a park which is now one of the most popular tourist places in Hong Kong. Foreign investors today are hurriedly building homes in Hong Kong, but they are focused on the rich sector, which is pushing prices higher on all housing. The poor segments suffer the most. From 2007 to 2015, prices on apartments 1,080 to 1,720 square feet doubled, and apartments under 430 feet had their prices go up 3.5 times, while the average income only grew by 42%. People without money for their own apartment agreed to their own cell. It might be small, but it's $130 a year. Normal working people can afford that. It's not $1,380 a month for a microscopic one-room apartment. About 50,000 people still live like that, and it's not acceptable to talk about living in a cell. You can live in a cell and save money working at some prestigious job like in a bank, but if your coworkers learn where you'll actually live, They'll make fun of you, even if they also secretly live in a similar cell. People sleep in one corner, eat in another, keep their stuff in a third, and if they're lucky, they'll have a TV in the fourth corner where they can relax after a long day at work. Now, Hong Kong plans to create artificial islands to solve the space problem to build more buildings in the future. There are 1,700 acres of artificial islands to the east of Lantau Island, the largest in Hong Kong where 400,000 apartments will be built in the future. The islands will start being made in 2025, and by 2032, Hong Kongites will be able to move to new homes. The grand beauty and magnificence of the most beautiful tall buildings in Hong Kong will inevitably stay in any travel's memory who is looking for new discoveries and exotic feelings, but clearly not everyone would want to live there. Leave a like if you agree with me. Well, that's all for today. Be sure to leave a comment to let me know how much you would have to be paid to live there. I think for me, at least a million bucks. And uh, we'll see you again next time.